Let's praise God this morning. Not because we're worthy. Not because of what we've done. Not because the music is perfect or the air is perfect or I'm perfect. We're going to praise Him because He is God. He is God. And what He's done for me deserves my praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Woo, been a minute since I've been up here. Hope y'all ready for this. I got about six months worth of preaching to let out in 30 minutes. Oh, I'm just kidding. 45. Second Kings, chapter 6. Begin with verse 8. And the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such place shall, I, shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called the servants and said, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, Telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy and see where he is, that I might send and fetch him. And it was told, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent, the, sent thither horses and chariots and great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and he gone forth, behold, the host compassed the city, both with horses, chariots. And the servant said unto him, Alas, master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. needs a shout over that one. And Elisha prayed and said, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit that we feel here this morning. I pray God that you not only anoint our ears to hear, God, but anoint our heart that we may listen to what you are saying. And we ask it in your precious, holy, holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You may be seated. This is the fourth or fifth sermon that I had lined up for today. So uh, this is it. This is the one. This is the one that I need to hear. Amen. I got one more ready out of it. So just you and me, Sammy. We got this. Praise the Lord. These two little balls of fluid that are placed in my head are really unique. They have been called one of the most complex organs in our body. Anybody know what they are? Eyeballs. How can something so small have so many different functions and moving parts? In many ways, the eyes are like digital cameras. Light is focused by the cornea, I believe it's called. It's that protective lens on the outside of your eye. And from there, 
it goes to the iris, which is right behind that. It's, the, it's like the diaphragm of the camera, controlling the amount of light that it reaches. The eyes have a crystalline lens. I'm going somewhere, y'all stay with me. It's only 30 minutes. Have a crystalline lens located behind the pupil to further focus in the light. The focus of the cornea and the crystalline lens reach the retina, which is in the back of the eye. Thank God for Google, right? I really sound like I know what I'm talking about. The retina acts like an electronic image sensor of a digital camera, converting the optical images to an electronic signal that sends through the optic nerve that goes through the cortex of the brain. All of this happens like that. Wow. The eyes. Truly amazing is this little organ that we have taken for granted so many times. If I was, to, if I was given a choice, the eyes or a limb, I would need to see. A lot of you are going, no. <laughs> I would need to see. I would need to be able to focus. And there's so much more to the eye than just those five things I mentioned. I mean, there, there's, there's tears that are, carry lubrication to the eye. There's muscles that move the eye. There's blood that brings nutrients to the eye. All of this is happening simultaneously as you are seeing and focusing through three different lenses before it even reaches the cortex of the brain to tell you exactly what you saw. <sighs> we see the world around us because of our eyes bend the light. As it's going through these stages, the light is being bent and the images is being broke down. But in my case, I went to the eye doctor this week. After four years of not going to the eye doctor. <laughs> Man, I got in trouble. I was going through all these tests and they changed the lenses read the line you can see and I look and she's like well go ahead and I'm looking just just read the line that you can see yeah I can't read any of them <laughs> has your eyes always been that bad <laughs> it's really bad when a doctor asks you that has your eyes always been that bad yes but I didn't notice because I kind of grew accustomed to blurry vis vision But I was suffering from what they call refractive errors. That's a fancy term for saying you really can't see very well. <laughs> refractive errors occur when, it is when the light is improperly bent. And it causes the vision to be somewhat obscure or blurred. This is known as nearsightedness, farsightedness, or astigmatism. So after asking the doctor, so how bad are they? So, well, she said, well, your right eye is nearsighted. I said, well, that explains when I'm talking to somebody, I look like this while I'm looking at them. Your left eye is farsighted. And you suffer from astigmatism. I go big or I go home. I mean, I want it all. So, it's kind of like that with the church today, right? Some of us in the church are seeing things way down the line. And then others in the church are seeing things right here. And they can't see further. And those over here can't see closer. And then you've got some of us that really can't see at all. Our vision is obscured. 
as I was studying for this message, I began to think, I was like, God, you want me to do a message on vision? I mean, how many sermons do we need to hear on vision? Catch the vision, see the vision, embrace the vision. Talk about the vision, walk the vision. Study the vision. Not division, just vision. How many times, why do I need to teach this or preach this? Why, why is this the word that you want gone forth? He said, because the vision of my people is obscure. Sometimes we miss it because it's just a little blurry and we need to go back to the eye doctor and get our vision repaired, adjusted. Fixed, so we can see what God wants us to see, so we can do what God wants us to do clearly and focused. We have the truth and we read it, but we really are having issues seeing it. This church has a vision, this church has a purpose. This church has a cause. You can clap any time now because this is good. Thank you. If our vision is messed up, obscure, blurry, we cannot accomplish those things that God wants to accomplish. For years, I've gotten used to just being blurry. I'm squinting. I'm blinking. I'm driving down the road. And I'm thinking, man, I can't see that street sign, but I'm kind of familiar with the area, so I bet I can find this house anyway. And I do, three trips around the block. But the church has gotten used to vision that's a little blurry. We've just become accustomed to it, thinking this is just the way it is. The servant of the man of God, as we read about, had vision problems. Oh, my Lord, my Master, what are we going to do? There's so many of them out there. Elisha prayed, open the eyes of my servant. Open his eyes that he may see that there is more with us than there is with them. Church, there's more with us than there is with them. We are compassed about with such a cloud of witnesses. Angels are around us every day protecting us and guiding us and helping us. More of them with us than there are against us. But we don't see that because our vision has refractive errors. The vision is the bridge between present and future. Vision gives pain a purpose. Hmm? As you go through life and the struggles and the, and the things that happen around us, if there's no vision, all of it is for naught. I, I think of, and I'm going to use my father-in-law because he doesn't embarrass very easily. Recently, he got injured. Collarbone, shoulder, something. And he, and he went to the doctor and he got his sling that he always wore properly. Because the doctor told him to. And after a period of time, he had to go through this, uh, this thing called uh, physical therapy. That was the best thing he's ever done. He had so much fun looking forward to it week after week, day after day. It would hurt. It would hurt. The ther- physical therapy hurts. Well, what happens is we go through this life and we see our struggles and we see the things that we have to go through. It hurts. But if there's no vision to get better, the pain is for naught. 
The vision of getting better and being able to work my shoulder and get underneath the cars and do what I'm supposed to do every day, all day long. If I didn't have a vision to do that, then all the pain I went through physical therapy is for nothing. So the vision gives pain purpose. I'm not saying catch the vision I'm saying let your vision become clear we have the vision we know what we're supposed to do but it needs to become clear it needs we need to know the purpose we need to see not only nearsightedness what we need to do now farsightedness what we need to do then And become clearly focused on the task at hand with the vision that God has given us. So what's the difference between a dream and a vision? Yeah, that's what I thought when I asked myself that question. Here it is. The difference between a vision and a dream is that a dream happens while you're sleeping. A vision is while you're awake and doing something. God is coming back for a church with a vision. We've already gone through the dream stage. Now it's time to wake up, catch the vision, embrace the vision, and be the vision, and do the vision. That's what God's calling us to do. Awake. From your sleep, awake from your comfort zone, awake from those things that are setting you down every day and draining your spirit and draining your energy. Catch the vision, embrace it. Are you a dreamer? Relaxing, kicking back in your recliner, which some of you wish you were doing right now, but you can't because I'm here. Awaken. See the vision that God has placed for you, not only as individuals, because each one of us has a purpose. Each one of us has a vision. But corporately as a church, come together and be the vision. See it clearly without any refractive errors love saying that refractive errors get it fixed get it adjusted do what you got to do fast a meal some of us could fast a week find yourself a prayer closet find yourself get to the eye doctor church praise God are we dreamers or visionaries Got two. The rest of them, get on board. Let's go. It's going to be a long afternoon. In order for a vision to be effective, it must contain three sights. Philippians chapter 3. 13 and 14. Says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Turn to your neighbor and say, forget the past. Turn to your other neighbor and say, forget the past. Forgetting those things which are behind you, reaching forth unto those things which are before. Turn to your neighbor and say, look forward. Oh, every time I ask you guys to say something to somebody, you guys say a lot more than what I just asked you to say. It's cute. That's all right. I press toward the mark, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Foresight. We have to have foresight. Foresight is the act of looking. Care, Care or provision of the future. 
Stop looking back thinking you are going forward. God is telling us this right now. Some of us are continually looking back. Thinking that we're moving forward. One thing I notice about the, the type of truck I drive for work is it's got this really big windshield. It's huge. You just see everything. But it doesn't have a rear view mirror because I can't see behind me anyway. So a lot of guys, they get, they get, in, they get in. It's just a 24-foot box truck, 26-foot. A lot of guys, they, they get in and they, and they go, I can't see to back up. I said, don't put yourself in a position where you have to. Why are we worried about going in reverse? We go forward, onward. I'm in a logistics company. I'm in, that's the business I have. I deliver stuff. People say, what do you deliver? Stuff. I just deliver stuff. It's sometimes little boxes, sometimes big boxes, but I deliver stuff. If I stop or if I start going backwards, guess what? I'm not doing my job. Church, if we stop or we start going backwards and looking backwards, guess what? We're not doing our job. God has called us to move forward. That is the sight. Foresight. Looking ahead. Man, I just might be preaching before this is over with. I remember as I was learning to ride a motorcycle. And the instructor, the person that's, that's showing me the ropes and the tricks and stuff, and he says, everywhere you turn your head, that is the direction that your bike will go. How many riders do we have? I know at least three, four, five, six. Is that not true? If you're going down the highway and you're just having a good time, well, I'll stand like this because I look better this way than I do this way. So you're going down the highway and you're just riding like this. And all of a sudden you go, oh, that's pretty. Guess what? Your bike's going to go. Every time. It doesn't matter how focused you think you are. You get your eyes off the task at hand. You get your eyes off the road in front of you. You're going to go the direction that you're going to look. Every single time. And church, we've been doing it too long. We've been letting those things in the past overtake us in the present, which is destroying our future. Because of our foresight. Because we've lost our foresight. Seeing those things which are ahead. If whatever you're facing and whatever you're looking at, that's the direction you're going... So, if you're not focused and looking at Him, you're not going towards Him. Right? So, this will blow y'all's minds. Ready? If you're not going towards Him, you're going away from Him. And what do you think you're going to get accomplished going away from Him? Death, despair, Anxiety, depression, issues, issues, issues. And then you're going to shake your fist at God. Why aren't you here? Because you're not going towards me. Because you got off focus. We've heard this word a few times. You've got distracted. When we focus on Christ, His will, His way, we will fulfill our purpose in his calling. Amen? Amen? So foresight is like looking through a telescope. We can kind of see what's ahead of us. Abraham was given a promise. I will make you the father of many nations. Well, God, I don't have a son. Let me worry about the details. I'm going to make you a father of many nations. So at that point on, Abraham started looking through his telescope and seeing, I'm a father of many nations. 
It doesn't matter what happens. God said, I'm a father of many nations. And he kept moving forward, and he kept fulfilling what he was supposed to do. And he kept doing the right thing. He became a father of many nations. He was looking through a telescope. So what's next? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. And that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory and his inheritance. Insight. It's like... It's like looking through a microscope. You can really see the details. So with this vision, we can see afar off, but we need that insight. Looking through the eyes of Jesus, understanding, seeking the wisdom, understanding what it's really all about. Why am I here? It's not because I need friends. I need what God has for me. I need that insight. I need to hear when God speaks. I need to follow His direction. Not because... It's the easiest way to go, but because it's the only way to go. One of the gifts of the Spirit is the gifts of discernment and understanding and seeing the fruit of it. Discernment is insight. Seeing it for what it is. Allowing God to work and to move freely. Insight takes us out and puts him in. I no longer need control. I no longer want control. It's no longer my calling. It's his calling on me. Insight. So from from insight, we have oversight. As individuals, we are responsible for our own vision. But as a church, who is the overseer? Who is responsible to ensure that the vision stays within focus? Not everybody at once. Who's responsible for that? Who's our overseer? Who's the overseer for the church, for the vision of the church, to ensure that the church's vision is is going the direction that God wants it to go? It's the pastor. So he's our oversight. So if... Pastor Nate starts going, no, I'm going to do my own thing. He can go rein me in and say, calm down there, high speed. Stand down, Captain. Let God do the work. Because I have a tendency to want to fix everything and everybody. Let God do it. We have to have that oversight. The vision must have foresight, insight, and oversight in order to be effective. The right vision will allow us to see things differently. There's a story. Three bricklayers. They started their task on building a wall for a home. 
And this guy was passing by. And he saw the first bricklayer. And he said, what are you doing? I know what I would have said. <laughs> what are you doing? What does it look like I'm doing? I'm laying bricks. Oh, okay. So he goes walking along to the next one. He said, what are you doing? And the guy hatefully says, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm building a wall. Oh, okay. So he goes on for a little bit and he sees the third bricklayer. And he said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm building a wall for a wonderful family that needs a home. When your vision is corrected, you're going to see the task at hand as a whole. You're not just going to be laying bricks. You're not going to just be building a wall. But you're going to be building a home, a sanctuary, a place for peace, a place of safety. When you see things the way God wants us to see things, when our vision is corrected, we'll see things just a little differently. Which one of those workers, the one laying bricks, the one building a wall, or the one building a home, do you think did better work? The one building a home because he could see what he was doing. If I'm going to build a great big ship, guess what? I'm not going to find the best craftsman the money can buy. I'm going to find the guy who loves the sea. Y'all better write that down. That was good. I don't care what you say. Thank you. It's okay. Y'all simmer down. Our vision. I'm not here to tell you to catch the vision. Because I believe this church already has. But what I'm asking you to do is to examine your vision. Examine your eyesight. When I put these glasses on for the first time Thursday, I went, whoa. That's cool. I can read that street sign over there. I know what it said. Was I not happy without it? No, I was happy. I was okay. But man, oh man, when you put them on, not only do I look good, but I can see good. There's not a whole lot of amens over there. I can see good. There you go. Praise the Lord. Let's look inside ourselves today. Let's look inside of ourselves this morning. And see that our vision becomes focused. Remembering that vision gives pain the purpose. That no matter what we are going through. No matter what we have to deal with. If our vision is right. The pain and the struggles will have a purpose, will make us stronger, not weaker. Oh, it hurts. Oh, doing this therapy hurts. Going through the struggle of this life hurts. Dealing with employees hurts. Amen. But my vision is that my place of employment becomes a smooth operating machine where people come in, they load up, they leave, and they come back with an empty truck. How easy is that? It's not. But the vision gives the trial a purpose and a reason. 
What's our vision? How's our vision? Are we looking through foresight and insight with oversight? Or are we just surviving? Are we just driving around? Squinting? Trying to see, make sure I'm between the lines. It's doable. It's possible. But there's nothing like a clear, undistorted vision. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand.